So here we are. On Sunday, my pastor, you made an analogy about boxing match where we need to be strategic with our punches and not waste them. And now today is Friday. I wanna remind all of us here that we've been fighting all week, wasting some punches, starving the dog, fought back, rewriting our stories and getting assurance that help is on the way. However, today, our father is ushering and preparing us to the Sabbath rest. I would say in our boxing match during the week, God is giving us a break. Just like in the boxing match, when the bell rings, we say, yo, saved by the bell. As we take the break to revive, to be given water and to be given air and to be bandaged and to be cleaned of the wounds. Therefore, we thank God for the bell in our lives. I cannot wait to hear what God has given Pastor Jeffrey to share with us this morning. Over to you, Pastor. Good morning, everyone. It's indeed my pleasure to come to you once again this morning. We thank God for the privilege that he has given us to gather again this morning. I'm sorry for the uh, hitch. Uh, it was beyond uh, my control, but I'm glad we are back. Nice to see you, all of you this morning who have joined in. We thank God for we have woken up. It's by his grace that we are up again this morning. It's not the alarm. It's just the grace of God that we are awake. Thank you so much, Sister uh, Thule, and all of us who have joined in. You can just write good morning again. I saw Mfundisi yesterday. I saw what I have picked so well. And Morut, I saw Morut. Morut is another word. So thank you so much. May we pray as we get started. Almighty Father God, we thank you so much. God, speak to us this morning yet again. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the, the, the series has been War Room. And we say the War Room is a room in a military building or headquarters where decisions are made and strategies are laid down. And we've been trying to, to lay down some strategies, one or two, uh, from Sunday. We've seen quite a number of things. And this morning, the strategy is the power of two, the power, the power of two, the power of two. I, I read about uh, draft horses and their ability to pull large loads, great loads. They're very strong, they're very muscular animals. They're used to pull, carry loads, huge, huge, huge loads. Uh, one draft horse can pull 3,600 kilograms or thereabout, thereabout. 3,600 kilograms of, 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 of luggage or load. And we would quickly, we would quickly assume that because one can pull 3,600, then two will definitely pull uh, 7,200. That's you, you multiply by two, but that's, that's wrong. Come on, that's wrong. You, you, you are flat wrong if you thought that way. Two draft horses can pull around 14,000, 14,000 kilograms. Just think about that, the, the synergy, the, the collaboration, the, the, the partnership, the alliance can produce a lot. It's, it's just unequal. So that what one could achieve, you know, is, is not compared. You, you don't just double what one could achieve. No, 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 it's not, you know, it, it's unequal. It's unparalleled. And so this morning I want to talk about the power of two, working together by two, multiplies strength. And I will quickly take you to the Bible in the book of Mark chapter six and verse number seven, where Jesus Christ is sending his disciples and he gave them authority. And he tells them, you go two by two, not one, but two by two. The Bible says, calling the 12, he sent them. He began to send them out two by two. He did not send one by one. And again, if you go to the book of Luke chapter 10, Luke 10 verse one tells you that 
He also called 72. He appointed 72 others. And he also sent them to go out two by two to every town and every place where they were to go. They were to move two by two. They were not to walk alone. They were always able to strengthen each other if they walked two by two, not one by one. And I, want, I came to tell you this morning that please don't do your spiritual life alone. Come on, don't do this life alone. Find someone that you can work with. Come on, you, you should not work alone. You should not work alone. Find someone that you can work with. Find a prayer partner, someone that you pray with, someone who could hold you even accountable, someone that you share issues with, someone that you agonize before the presence of God with, and sometimes someone who can be your accountability partner, someone you, you, you talk, you tell them you know, your challenges, your issues, your troubles, your temptations, the things that are weighing you down in this life. In other words, I'm saying we are in a battlefield and because you are a soldier in the army of the Lord, then you don't want to do it alone. You have to find what is called in military a body. So this is this about a, no, a battle body, somebody that you are fighting this life with because we are in a great controversy. So this is this is this is a sixth uh, strategy, the sixth secret for, for doing this life. Don't do it alone. Find someone that you can do this life with. Listen to the wise sayings that if, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. <laughs> if you want to go far in this spiritual life, find someone that you can hold each other's shoulders. You can, you can work together. You can grow together. They can help you. They can nurture you. They can encourage you. Sometimes they can challenge you. They look into your eyes and tell you, no, you, you can't do this. This is, this is not right. This is, this, this is stupid. You can't. Or they, they, they guide you as you are making the decisions of this life. I read in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. It doesn't necessarily refer to marriage issues, but we always use it uh, in marriage issues where the Bible says two are better than one. <laughs> That's the principle. According to the economics of God, two are better than one because they have a good return. They, they find success. That's what the good news uh, Bible says. When, when one falls down, the friend is there to help the other. No, 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 no. And, and when one is feeling cold, the other one warms them up. So think about this in a spiritual perspective. You are feeling cold and spiritually, and there's someone who tells you, come on, we can make it. You are almost giving up, but there's someone who nudges you and says, come on, we, we, can, we can still push on. Please don't, don't throw in the towel. No, don't, 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 don't. So notice, 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 notice this. Notice the benefit of two. Number one, the benefit of two is success. The Bible says in verse number nine, Two are better than one because they will achieve more together. That, that's very clear. That's very clear. You are going to achieve much when you do it together. Number two is encouragement. When one falls down, then that is in verse 10. When one falls down, one is there to help the other. That is Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and verse 10. Number three, they get strength. They get strength. When one is weak, the other one is there. In fact, in, in, in verse number 12, it says... No, even three, when they become three, it, 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 it gets even better now. A bundle of you know, sticks cannot be broken. A threefold cord cannot be broken because you, 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 you bring the power together, the strength together. And, and number four thing that I can pick from that verse is defense. Though one may be overpowered, two, the Bible says, can defend themselves. Just think about this. You are in school and you are facing some trouble, some bullies. No, bullies, bullies, bullies. You're, you're facing some bullies and, and, and all of a sudden your brother shows up. You know that that changes everything. Come on, that changes the equation. Two are better than one. The power of two. I read a very profound scripture. This has always challenged me. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse number 30. Which book did I say? Deuteronomy 32 and verse number 30. The Bible says, how should one chase a thousand? Now listen to that. One is chasing a thousand. How should one chase 
a thousand. Now, you would quickly say that two will chase 2,000, but no, 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 no. That, that is not in God's economics. That is not in God's mouth. How could one chase a 1,000, and it says again, and two put 10,000? No, one is equal to 1,000, but when you are two, you chase 10,000. Come on, come on, come on, come on. That tells me that when we come together and we are doing this thing together, we are more powerful. We are more powerful. I read in the book of Acts chapter 16, the story of Paul and Silas. And the mistake the jailers did was to put two people together who are agreeing, Paul and Silas. How do you put them in one cell room? Two people who could sing, two people who could pray. How do you put two together who love God? Come on, two people who love God, two people whose hearts are beating for God. And that is why they could not contain them. The Bible says Paul and Silas began to sing. I want to I always believe that Paul was the one who was praying and Silas, because of S, was the one who was singing. And, and the Bible says there was a strong earthquake and the prison doors were wide open. Come on, there's always power when we have somebody that we are praying with. Yes, we could pray as a community like this, 340, 50, 60 people, we could pray as a church, but we've got to get to a point of saying, I want to identify somebody who can help me grow, somebody who can nudge me, somebody who can be my prayer partner, somebody who can strengthen me, somebody that we can pull and push and, and, and move together. And the Bible says that the prison doors was open. It was at midnight when they were praying, when they began to sing. It may seem like a midnight in your darkest hour, but please don't worry. Find someone that you can talk to God to. You are facing losses. You are facing sicknesses. You are facing financial challenges. You have uh, relationship break, uh, breakages and things are not looking up in your life. Everything seems to be looking down. We pray together here, but find someone that you can talk to God to. And you can, you can be vulnerable before that person because you trust the person. You tell, this, these are the issues in my life. Please. Guide me, please pray for me, please tell me a word and, and, and trust me there is power when two people come together to pray. I read in the book of Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, the Bible says, again, truly I tell you, again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about something, Two of you agree, then it shall be done. Then the Bible says in verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there amongst them. No, we are not called to be lone rangers as Christians. Instead, we are called to be members of a body and we work together. And the devil knows this very well, that when you work together, you are more strong. When you have a spiritual partner, you are stronger. If you have a prayer partner, you are more effective and your prayers are fervent. He will not, he, he will, he will want to create division. He will want to make it hard for you to connect with someone. He will want to make you so busy that you cannot reach out to a group like this or even form a relationship with somebody that can help you, that you know, that can nudge you, that can empower you, that can fuel you. So there, there, there are three. There are three common tactics that the devil uses. How many tactics? The three common tactics that the devil uses. Number one is deception. What did I say number one is? Deception. And, and Jesus talks about this very clearly in, in, in John chapter, chapter 8 and verse 45. You want to believe so? Uh, where he says, you are of your father, the devil, who's been a liar and he's been a murderer and is a father of lies. And even when he speaks something like truth, you know, it is, it is less with lies, you know, half truths that are used as a bait to hold you. So his weapon is deception. And, and that's why we as Christians ought to get to a point of asking ourselves even difficult questions. What I believe, is it in accordance with the word of God? Come on. What my church teaches, is it in accordance with the word of God? What I have been practicing, is it in line with what the word of God says? So I've got to interrogate my beliefs. There are people who are Christians, but they don't really know what they believe in. And I get terrified. I always want to check what I believe in and what my church does. Is it in line with the word of God or it's something else? So check what you believe also. I'm challenging you this morning because the devil can use deception to deceive you. 
and to lead you. He wants to deceive the world. world. The, the world, world. Do, do you know what you believe in? Or oh, the devil is deceiving you? Do you can, can you stand and say, this is what my church believes? This is what I believe. This is from the Bible. There are many people who don't, who, who don't know what they, what they believe in. I, I remember this uh, story I always use. Um, a woman was asked, what do you believe? She said, I believe what my church believes. She was asked again, what does your church believe? She said, my church believes what I believe. And she was asked the third time, then what does you and your church believe? She said, I and my church believe the same thing. I mean, she, she didn't know, she didn't know. She could not really stand and, and say, this is what I believe and this is what the Bible says. It, it's about that time that we who have been called uh, by God rise up and really can uh, defend and talk about what we believe. Number two is diversion. He wants to make you so busy, divert you, distract you, keep you so busy, turn you away from building a robust relationship with Jesus. And so we could be busy, like I said this week, busy doing even the right things that we don't really get to establish a strong relationship with Jesus. He wants to keep us busy running after this, after our job, after this business, after that issue, ever busy until we don't get to establish uh, a, a strong relationship and, and we lose our spiritual compass. And number three, so number one again is deception. Number two again is diversion. And number three is isolation, isolation. Now that's a tactic the devil uses. And, and, and that's one tactic also the animals uh, use. Most animals who aren't there, uh, I mean, other animals will always use a tactic of isolating. Hunting lions, for example, will never charge directly into the middle of a herd of buffaloes or maybe uh, zebras or maybe antelopes. What will they do? They will pick out a target, separate it from the safety of its herds or flock and attack it. So separation, isolation, the devil wants to do that. He wants to isolate you. And so when you say, mm, I'm not going to church again. Mm, I'm not going to that group again. Mm, I'm fed up. Mm, I'm disappointed. Mm, I'm not party to that again. Then the devil is celebrating. If Satan can isolate us from the community like this, then he wins. If, if Satan can put you aside, then he wins. If you get hurt and you walk away from church, Satan celebrates. So please stay in the box. If, if he can drive a wedge between a husband and a wife, that is the beginning of the end. He wins. If he can drive a wedge between uh, parents and children, that's the beginning. He wins. He wants to isolate. He wants to separate. And when we are separated, then we become vulnerable. We become weak. It's, it's not easy to take on a united church, he knows. It's not easy to take on a united family. The devil knows that. So he will, he will try to isolate us from, from the heart, from the Bible or com community, and, and put us away. I read in the Bible, and there are over 100 parts where the Bible says one another or each other, because this spiritual life was meant to be lived together. You have a body. And I checked in the military, you will rarely find a soldier who walks alone, who goes to patrol, who goes on duty alone. No, 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 you cannot find that. They use what is known as a body system. They, they work together, at least in twos to be able to help one another. And so we are in a battlefield also. We cannot walk one-on-one, -on -one, one by ourselves. No, 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 we need to have a body. You need to say today, who, who, who is it that is going to be my prayer partner? Someone who will pray with me, someone who will cover me, someone at least who can make a call, someone who wants to check on me, a body who will nudge me to good works and encourage me. The Bible says in, um, Hebrews 10, 25, don't give up the habit of meeting together like this. Because when we do like this, th then we nudge each other to good works. So you, you need someone who can check your, your blind spots. There are things that we cannot see in our lives. We think we are fine. We think the choice we made is okay. We think all is fine with us. Only that there is somebody who can see what we cannot see. If you are a driver, you know what a blind spot is. There are things that you may not be able to see using the, the mirrors that you have. Because they, they, they are in, in, in a position that the mirrors may not really easily, easily capture. But when you have a body, uh, a partner who can help you, who can help you to see the things that you cannot see. And, and I checked in the Bible. I checked in the Bible. For Moses, there was always 
you know, someone like Aaron. For Paul, there was a Silas. For Paul or for Timothy, there was a Paul. For David, there was a Jonathan. For, for Elijah, maybe there was an Elisha somewhere. For, for Naomi, there was a Ruth. You know, they, they always had someone. For, 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 you know, for, for Peter, there was a John. Who, who they would always do stuff together. They they did multiple things together. They were fishermen and they and they spent hours together. And, and if you read in Luke 22 and, and verse 8, you'll find that they, they were even sent to prepare uh the, 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 the supper, the Passover uh, you know, meal together. And, and and if you read in John, I mean Acts chapter 3, you find that they were going to worship together, and that's when they, they met the, the lame man. They were going together. And I have a question today. Do, do you have people in your life that you do things together? Very close people, very close. I know when we meet on a platform like this, we are so many, we may not be able to get so much intimate and so much close, uh, but maybe with time we do. But, but you've got to identify somebody that you can do this life with. Where are you taking your friends and where are your friends taking you? So you've got to find somebody that you are working together for the sake of the kingdom of God, pulling together agonizing together. Let, let, let me finish by referring to the book of Mark chapter two. In, in Mark chapter two, verse one to five, we find the story of four men who brought their friend to Jesus. Four men who brought their friend to Jesus. The guy, the guy was sick and they, they, they say this man should go to Jesus. Do you have such friends in your life? Do you have such friends in your life? Your, the circle, the inner circle of your friends. People who pull you, <laughs> literally pull you. That we've, we've not seen you in church. No, 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 no. We, you, we've be, you've been missing in prayer. You know, you, you, you've not been coming. You've not been waking up at five. People who drag you. And come on, maybe you need to change your 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 your, your list, the list of your inner friends. You know, people who are around you. you. You need friends who can do crazy things to take you to Jesus. Crazy things to bring you to these five a.m. prayers. People who can do crazy things. I like these four people. They did a crazy thing. They, they took their friend up the roof and they lowered it. Come on, can you be a crazy friend also maybe this weekend, maybe this week, and do crazy things to take someone to Jesus, to take someone to, to bring someone to a prayer service like this next week, to take someone to church tomorrow. Come on, maybe, maybe you can do some crazy stuff crazy thing. Think of a crazy thing that you can do to help someone come to Jesus Christ. Take your friends to Jesus. Come on, I'm giving you a challenge this morning as we come to the end of this. I'm giving you a challenge. I'm giving you a challenge. Identify someone that you can literally drag, literally pull and bring them to Jesus. Sometimes it's so difficult. I don't know why we are not so much excited. And, but, but I read something. I read something that shocked me. I read something that shocked me. Suppose, suppose for every one person you brought to Jesus, you are given $1,000. Suppose for each person that you attempted to bring to Jesus, either you succeeded or you failed, but you really attempted. And, and, and for each person that you attempted to bring to Jesus, you are given $1,000. Would you endeavor to lead any more souls to him than you have been endeavoring to do before? Would you double your efforts? Would you increase? Would you multiply? Would it change the way you've been doing your stuff? Because, you know, I got somebody, one, two, three, four, five people. I will work on those and I have $4,000. Would it change? Come on, would it change your urgency? It's, it's my prayer today, my friend. That, that we, we may rise up and say, Jesus Christ, you've called me. I have known you. I want to follow you. I want to do your will. I will go. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to agonize. I want to work with somebody. I want to identify a weak person that I can be praying for. I identify, I, I talk to them and I befriend them and I want to power them. I want to fuel them. I want to um, encourage them. It's my prayer that Jesus Christ will use us also as conduits, as agents, to help somebody who needs our help, somebody who is struggling, somebody who has drifted away from church, somebody who is no longer on fire for Jesus like they used to be. It's my prayer, ladies and gentlemen, that we may find somebody that we can walk. The power of two. It's so powerful. The power of two. Powerful, powerful. Come on, I want to pray. I know I've taken a lot of time today. Let's pray. Eternal Father and God in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege that you've given us to meet once again. 
And we thank you, God, for these strategies that you've been inculcating into our lives this week. God, I thank you for loving us. And I thank you, Lord, that we found time to connect this morning yet again. I pray, Lord, that you may help all of us to identify people who can, we can be praying for, we can be praying with, people we can be accountable to, people we can be vulnerable to, and we tell them our issues. And we can trust them that they will present them before your throne room. They will not share with people. God, help us to learn how to walk in truth, because it's very clear from your word that you've always desired us as a corporate. We identify even people in in, in, in the body of believers that we can work with closely as we build each other. Bless us today, Lord, and give us victory. It's because we've prayed in Jesus' name. Amen.